We're here at the Ellis Theater, and now it's the Delta Arts Alliance. And I'm about to do a cooking presentation. I'm not a chef. I like to talk, so this should be okay. <laughs> Are you listening? Damn. I'm glad Patrick's here, so I'm not the only guy in the room. <laughs> okay, we want to thank y'all for coming tonight for our um, second class and fill the card for appetizers for the ultimate party. We've got Sapper Chosen here. Down there, he used to be at 1933. He has two, well, no, it's one restaurant in Drew's. They serve lunch Monday through Friday. and then Tuesday through Friday and dinner on Saturday night. We got to know Stafford at the Grammy party for the Grammy Awards in February, and I was in charge of food. And so got to know him there. He's so much fun to work with. So when we decided to do this, I said, I need to call. Well, I think I need to start by saying I'm not a chef. I kind of want to give you a little bit of background on me. Well, you know, I, st I opened Stafford's and Drew in 2005. And, and I'm going to tell you an absolutely true story. I'd never worked in a restaurant in my life. So I laid in bed one night. We wrote just a little sandwich menu. That's all we did with sandwiches at the time. We didn't cook. We didn't really cook anything. So. I ordered from a company called U.S. Foods. We got all the food in on Thursday night. We cooked the entire menu Thursday night and opened up the next day, and it was a disaster. So <laughs> we served about 110 people in Drew. And of course, we're talking about 12 years ago. So that was like one of the busiest days we've ever had was the first day. We closed down that weekend, opened back up the next week, and, and really it was pretty smooth after that, so I was kind of lucky. About three years after that, we decided we wanted to start cooking some real food, opening at night some, and so I hired a chef, and the first chef I worked with was Dave Cruz, which y'all probably all know Dave. And so David and I are like really, really good friends this day. We, we know enough on each other from working together that it's like Reagan and Gorbachev. I mean, it, we're mutually assured destruction if one of us tells the other one is going down too. So, so I, I'll never say I have anything bad to say about Dave. If you've ever heard of Miss Stratton's uh, tuna salad and the pimento and cheese, like that's the only pimento and cheese I'd ever eaten and I hated it. I thought it was the most god awful thing. And so I hated pimento and cheese all my life until I started working with people like Dave and they made homemade pimento and cheese and I'm like, you know what, that's actually pretty good. So, so it's become one of those southern staples that we use an awful lot in the restaurant in a lot of different dishes. We're going to do some pimento and cheese stuffed mushrooms tonight. What we learn to do or what I've learned to do in working with these chefs is you take a recipe that your grandmother made and you swap out like one ingredient and you've got something totally different. I don't have it down pat. I mean, <laughs> you know, I tell you a funny story. I didn't learn, we, crawfish sauce, everywhere you go around the Delta, they love this crawfish sauce, you know, and we did it in 1933. I never learned how to make it until the last week they were open. And I'm like, before we close, y'all gotta teach me how to make this crawfish sauce. And I'll tell you this, interestingly, being across from a la carte, that was really the inspiration for Stafford's when we opened in a lot of ways. Lunch we do, we have a full, we have a menu that's, like I said, it'll kind of remind you of a la carte or the warehouse. And that's been, some of the things on that have been unchanged since we opened 12 years ago because they're just really popular. But, um, and then we do a plate lunch every day. Would you go get those mushrooms out of the oven? Yeah. I think they probably want to try some now. <laughs> they're probably tired of hearing me talk. Yeah, it's a good time to wind up <laughs> in between courses, you know. I I am so much better looking if y'all drink more wine. I should have had this open in a bowl, but I didn't think that through. I've never done a cooking show before, so I don't know. The reason I like this is souffle sounds like it's really expensive, number one. <laughs> So it sounds impressive, but it is like the easiest thing you've ever seen. Did y'all see it, by the way? I mean, look how pretty it turned out. Where are you from? Originally New York. So how did you end up in Cleveland, Mississippi? Oh, right. Delta State is what brought me. Um, I had um, done some sports writing. Um, in the past and ended up doing an article and one thing led to another and the next thing I knew I was on a plane coming down here to begin my work on a graduate degree. So what, what was your graduate degree? 
health, physical education, and recreation. And you fell in love with the town, or what happened? Um, immediately fell in love with Cleveland. And I tell people that all the time. I'm like, you have an instant reaction to the Delta, and you're either going to love it, and you're always going to love it, and your appreciation is only going to grow deeper and deeper for it, or you might come to respect it, but you're never going to feel that, right? I tell, you know, like, because I still have a lot of friends up north, and they're like, Mississippi? You're still in Mississippi? I'm like, if you don't, if you haven't set foot, you can't say anything. Because the biggest testament I can give to this state and to this city and to this area is this is where I'm choosing to raise our family. Like, yeah. um, I can't imagine my little girl anywhere else. Does it shock your friends that are not from here? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. They think you lost your mind? Again, it's, I tell them, you can't, you, you don't know what you're missing until you come. Something about this place, don't you think, that just gets under your skin a little bit? For most people, like you say, everybody, some people get here and they just don't feel it. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I think, I think we're all searching for that connection yeah. somewhere. Um, I just consider myself very fortunate that I came here in the Mississippi Delta. So we've kind of got, I call this the Marvel origin story, comic book origin mm -hmm. story. So then you transition into being here at Delta Arts Alliance. Which is another blessing. I mean, I wake up, you know, and hit the, hit the floor each day thanking the good Lord. So how did you come along and partner up with them? The original group of women that formed this, they called themselves the Willing Souls. And at that time, it was when cuts were very deep to the education system and the arts were quickly disappearing from the public school classrooms. Um, and this women, this group rallied in response to that. And we put artists and art educators into the public school system at no, school, at no cost to the schools. At the end of a calendar year, um, last year alone, we were able to work in six Mississippi Delta counties and, and touch the lives of over 6,000 students. That's so. pretty awesome. I wonder, you know, that we put such emphasis on certain things in school, but art education is just not one of them. You know, there's there's that saying, you know, like, what's what's the earth without art? Ah, you know, I mean, there's so many different little catchy sayings about what we're looking at in a world that doesn't have art. Um, to me, what we're looking at is a world that's not connected. I mean, at every inner path that you have with art, whether it's um, the music you hear when you first wake up, whether it's the painting that, you know, spoke to you and reminded you of grandma, or whether it's, you know, spinning and dancing like no one's watching. You know, these are all outlets. They're expressions. And they're making us better. They're making us more available to the world we live. So tell us about the, you were telling me, all the different programs you have. Not only do we do the work inside the classrooms, um, because the day, what what second grade looked like for me is certainly not what second grade looked like for my daughter. I mean, it's just a different school day, yeah. right? And so while we still do a lot of work in schools, we also can have tremendous act impact in after school programs. And so we partner with after school programs throughout the Delta, but we also use our own space here that we're sitting in tonight. Um, and we've got 22 classes in six different concentrations. Um, we have our School of Dance, which is our largest, um, fastest growing program. And then we have our mini masterpiece classes, which we start at three and go all the way up. What is that? Um, so our mini masterpieces, art classes, is just introducing them to the visual art. Gotcha. Different. Um, Do they different. not get that in public schools? No. No kind of art program whatsoever in public schools? Because even I went to a private school and we still have an art program today. I didn't know there was zero, and that, that actually is really shocking to me that there's zero introduction art for. Yeah, and I mean, and some schools do have it because of a magnet or because of a grant or something like that. But generally speaking, in the Mississippi Delta. But generally speaking, in the Mississippi Delta, it's. Wow. Not. Yeah, that's pretty sad. How mm -hmm. do you guys get funded? So we do a lot of our work um, through grants. Um, Mississippi Arts Commission is one of our largest um, grant grantors, um, and then you know we've been very fortunate. King's Daughters, you know, local support um, and corporate support, corporate, corporate support, and well. then we also have um, membership. How does that work? How do you get in the membership? So um, certainly you can call the office eight four three 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 four four. 
um, or you've got our website, deltaarcalliance.org. Um, but each year, we just began our annual membership um, push. Um, we've got our annual membership meeting in September. That's pretty, so if you guys find it on Facebook, and we'll put the website right at the bottom of the screen. Perfect. But when you find it on Facebook too, you can click that, it'll take you right to the website where you can donate. How important are membership dues to you guys staying open? Yeah, so our, our operating expenses, I mean, light bills, that is completely membership based. You know, I mean, so um, we're able to support the daily day-to-day -day operations through our membership and our private that's, support. That's pretty good, actually. Our programming is all supported through um, grants and so forth. So you have to have membership to keep the doors open. Absolutely. Or the grants for the programming wouldn't matter at all. Absolutely. There is no doubt that the muscle that operates this organization is volunteer muscle. We've got a staff of one, um, yeah. full-time staff of one, um, and then we've got part-time bookkeepers, and then obviously our artists and residents are paid positions. Um, but like the event that you were at tonight, that's that's our programming committee right at work. Yeah. Um, you know, we're a working board, a working organization, and so there are a lot of people that recognize the need for the programming that we're offering and the opportunities that we're offering. What we do here is go back, 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 back.